Welcome to One Plus One. My name is Faye Clayton Mosley. We're on Wiradjuri country at Wagga Wagga. Nindu Balaninat, go in Bala Nindu Giyara Adri Numbangu. I just say good morning, everybody. My name's Gail Manson, and I'm a Wiradjuri elder from the Wagga Wagga, and I'm here to welcome you to Wiradjuri land. Welcome and hope you enjoy the show. Faye Clayton Mosley, thank you so much for joining me on One Plus One. Thank you for inviting me. Now, everyone that I've seen here on your country refers to you as Arnie Faye. Is that what I should call you as well? Oh, if, yeah, if you want to. I do want to. Yeah. Tell me, what does it mean to you when people refer to you as Arnie Faye? I think it just makes me understand the meaning of being an elder. I keep thinking, am I really that old? <laughs> they refer to me as an auntie. Yeah. But I love being an auntie and being called an elder. We'll, we'll certainly come back to the elder bit yeah. shortly. But we're here at your exhibition and I've been looking and thinking about your works, some that tell your story of, from your childhood, some that yeah. are about connection to country. What's the story you're trying to tell with this collection? Just trying to um, get people to have a better understanding of um, where I've come from and the history of my life being a Stolen Generation member and um, the journeys that I've had in trying to understand where I fit within the community. I paint a lot about that journey uh, because I find that my art heals my hurt. When you say your art heals that hurt, tell me about the process when you're um, putting brush to yeah. canvas. When you um, pick the brush up, it makes you forget about some of the things that have happened to you in the past. I often think, you know, I'm 77 next month. Um, should I retire? But I can't see that happening because it's, it's something that's within me and, and it comforts me. I want to talk a little bit about your growing up. It was not too far from, from Wagga Wagga, where you oh. and I are sitting right now. It was at Leeton's Waddle Hill. What was it like there when you were growing up? It was the maddest place. It was like a big extended family. There was over a thousand people at one stage. And was there lots of storytelling yes. from the aunties, from the yes, elders? Yes, And pulling you up too if you mucked up. You know, we'd sit around at night and have the fire going and, you know, you'd chuck some toast on the, some bread on the fire and make some toast. And the sharing and the caring of the community, you know, like um, when my mum and dad went to work, we had aunties that would look after the, the babies that stayed home. My parents worked at the cannery at Leeton, so, you know, we were never without the house was clean, we were well fed. We were at school. Um, education wise, we were very good students. Uh, mum and dad went to work one day and while they were gone, they took us. And my auntie ran and told my mum that they were putting us on the train um, and taking us to Cootamundra. There's actually a painting where the train's pulled up. The welfare officer has his ear and the police officer has my mum there hanging on to her. She wasn't allowed to come and talk to us. She was just there crying and screaming and they put us on the train and that was the last I seen of mum. So you saw her that yeah. day at the train? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you remember how that felt? Oh, because the little ones were crying. Like 
my little sister and and two brothers, they were younger than me. They were crying and wanting to run over to mum and the police and the welfare there were you know, holding them back. And she was horrified. She, you know, never forget it. So how does it feel to be back here? Um, it's OK now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've, since living in Wagga, I've come over every now and then to get rid of the angst and the ghosts, but uh, it's OK, you know. But it still brings back a lot of memories mm. yeah, of what happened. And, it would be hard to you know, trying separate. to fathom why we were here and where was Mum and Dad. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Iris, my elder sister, she was sort of being the mother hen and rounding us up and keeping us together and yeah. trying to um, calm the babies down, my two little siblings, because they were crying. Yeah. Yeah. We were told that we were going away on a holiday. So they tricked you? Yeah. Well, they did that to a lot of us girls, you know. You were going to the shops, you were going to the circus or something like that, you know. We always were told the reason why we were being taken was because of that. Um, and when we got to Kutamundra, it was like a nightmare. Aunty Faye, you, you invited us here today. Why was it important for you to show us this place and to e explain this place to Australians? I think it's important now that there's truth telling. This place was a terribly cruel place. You know, there were beatings, there was abuse. For a lot of many, many years, this was hidden. You know, we're the ones that are telling the truth about this place I lived at and I grew up here. And the impacts had, that it's had on me is lifelong. All the years of growing up in Chittamundra, not one person told any of us that they loved us. So we grew up in a, an environment where there was no love, no hugs, I couldn't play with my sisters. We were separated within the homes as well. We were all separated into different groups. And we weren't allowed to play with them. They had other kids to look after your little ones. And you had to look after the other little ones. As an 11 year old, I was looking after a little boy that was in there. And then other girls looked after my younger siblings, but I wasn't allowed to. So that continued the separation. The Holmes was Kutamundra's first hospital, but they had two morgues and the morgues were still there. They pulled one down. The other one was used for, to put um, tin food and that in. But then they also locked us in it too. In, in the morgue? Yeah, as punishment. So, yeah, so... Um, That's just harrowing. It, it, it was, but I don't know this faith that I have. It, you know, I, it, it impacted on me, but I wasn't scared. I get the shakes when I talk about it. But yet... Um, if I heard the other kids screaming and carrying on in the morgue, I'd sneak out and I'd hit the wall and say, you know, I'm here. I'll sit here at the window and talk until it's daylight, you know, to try and calm them down. I think there would be many Australians that would grapple with the, the cruelty yeah. of, of 
that, which is only a snapshot of, of the experiences, but of being locked in a morgue mm. and being never told that you were loved. Never. Being told that our parents didn't want us, uh, that we had to stay there, and uh, something that nightmares made of. And we had to stay there and settle down and live the life that they wanted us to do. Training us up to be domestic servants for no pay, but also whitewashing us into trying to get rid of our cultural upbringing and our cultural beliefs, um, and telling us that um, Aboriginal society wasn't Christianised, it was evil, so therefore we shouldn't be thinking about, you know, being an Aboriginal, to think white, to be white, to act white. When you go in there, all the ghosts of the past visit upon you and make you feel how much you've lost by being there. My parents were very good parents. My dad was a rat of the book in the second, thirteenth. He fought for this country and they took his children away. The dad fought in World War II uh, in the Middle East, in Libya. What did you learn about his service and what did he talk to you about? He, he didn't talk much, but I've, you know, I've got a lot of his uh, records. He was, um, a rat of the book, and he was in the second, thirteenth, which I believe had a very good record for what they'd done. I've got photos there of Dad, where he's actually in the trenches and he's with the other men and he's playing the banjo. So he, <laughs> he used to put on a show for them when they were in the trenches between the fighting and that. So. We often hear about how those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that served for Australia abroad were often treated quite poorly when they came home. Mm -hmm. Was that his experience? Yeah, my auntie, an auntie of mine, um, she was married to a non-Aboriginal soldier that came home. He was living where Dad was born. And Non-Aboriginal soldiers were given soldier settlement blocks, they were given houses and they were given jobs, but Aboriginal soldiers from here, including my dad, didn't receive anything. That home at Kuta Mundra was operated by the welfare Board. And part of the idea there, the, the principle, was really about training you and, and others as domestic servants. When you were about 14, I understand that you were taken to farms to do that work. Can you share what happened during that time? I worked on four different farms. I ran away from all of them because of the... Um, the treatment that I received and um, and there was some abuse as well so yeah how do you feel about that now oh it was really bad but um, you know I've got a I try and put on a a facade that doesn't allow my kids to see what I went through because I don't want them to be impacted by what I... But the, um, the intergenerational trauma is just... is discontinues today and it's gone from my grandkids to my great-grandkids in terms of they're now understanding what we went through. How do you deal with that pain? Prayers, lots of prayers. Yeah. I have very deep faith. I have to have it because it keeps me sane. If I lose it, 
then I lose who I am. You know, and that's the thing. You know, my faith keeps me grounded and it keeps me where I am. My faith is the faith that was taught to us, but also my, by people from the church, but also by my elders and my aunties, my, my traditional faith too. And, and I, I want to explore that because there are artworks in this collection that, yes. that look at Bayami, yeah. who is the creator for, right. for many First Nations people, yeah. particularly for your, your mob. Yeah. Where does that intersect with the faith that you were taught in the homes and how do you reconcile those different views or beings? The faith from both sides I had growing up. You know, my grandmum and my mum and they spoke the language and they were always surrounded by our elders at home. And not only that, the church was there. So we went to church too. And the teachings are similar. And if we look at the world as a whole, we look at people that have got a different faith, they have a different name for their God. And I really believe that our name, my name for that, that faith is the Lord, but it's also on par with Biami and, you know, his teachings. So I marry the two of them together and I believe in that. You were 19 when you reconnected with your mum. Mm. What was that like? I was nursing at Prince Alfred, it was so funny. And my brother found out where I was. It's the first time I'd met my brother as well. He came over and he said, Mum's living down at McDonald Town Station, which isn't that far from Prince Alfred. And he said, you've got to come down, and I said, Mum, I said, no, she, you know, I can't go and see because she didn't want us. We were told that our parents didn't want us. And, um, and I said, no, I said, I can't come now because I've got to, I'm just going on to do a shift. And he said, I'll be back tomorrow and you have to be ready to go down and meet Mum. And I said, no. I said, I'm working all this week. He and his friend came down and his friend picked me up and threw me over his shoulder in my nursing unit, carried me all the way up Missenden Road, across King Street, down to McDonald Town Station. He opened the door up and he said, Lily, here's your daughter Faye. Just like that. And I just, I, you know, I was shocked. I didn't know how to relate to her all. It took me a while to call her mum, you know, because we had this thing in, and all of us had thing, you know, this thing in our head where we're told our parents didn't want us, that's why we're there. Did you ever tell her that that's what they told you? Yeah. What did she say? Oh, she cried. I didn't have her for too long, like probably about four years, and then she died. And then I met my dad at mum's funeral, and he asked me who I was. And I said, I'm Faye, and he said, I'm your dad. That was the only word I said to my father. Then he was, you know, another, a sister or a brother took him over there, and we are all trying to get a, you know, trying to get a hold of him so we could talk to him. So I wanted to know, you know, things, but he was, there was eight of us and we are all, you know, wanting his attention. And um, then the next day he went back, he was living at Crang, so he went back home and he died down there. Not long after he returned home. It, it sounds, it feels, so cruel after so long apart that 
you had such a short time to reconnect. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we have to, you know, look at the impact it's had on us as stolen generation, girls and boys. Children today, they're still taking more and more Aboriginal kids away today than what they ever did when we were taken. And that's a policy that really has to stop. Part of the, the purpose of forced removals that become the Stolen Generation was about separating Aboriginality from people. How do you feel about your Aboriginality now? I love my, I love, I look, I'm a very proud Koori woman, Aboriginal woman. I love my culture and I love telling people that, you know, I'm part of the Wiratjuri tribe. And I also tell them that um, our Aboriginal communities have got a lot to offer. And, you know, people need to learn about Aboriginal history to get an understanding of the suffering and the pain that we've gone through. You know, you look at the massacres all over Australia and still people are dying in custody and because of being Aboriginal, you know. And I work with juvenile justice, I've worked with docs, you know, I've worked with community health. I've done nursing and uh, I was coming home here to get a job down in Leighton when we came down here. I was offered a job in Leighton and my auntie that was here told me, don't go down there, there's too much trouble. So I said to Bill, well, the only thing we can do is pick up the paintbrush again. to bring us here today because as well as that pain yeah. and, and as you mentioned really one of the points that destroyed your life to use your words you've also got an incredible collection of artworks right here that, that uh, is called from tribal tracks to, to train. train tracks yes. what's that about the reason i'd done the tribal tracks the, those paintings was my dad was a fettler and was sent to various areas from here where he helped lay down those tracks. And the, the tribal tracks were, were indicated where we used to walk as a tribe, you know. We used to visit from different towns and different areas. And the train tracks actually run across some of those tribal tracks and those song lines as they carry on. How does it feel seeing everyone gathering, really responding to your artworks? It's amazing, isn't it? I, I thought it was just so beautiful, you know. There was a particular piece in your collection yeah. called Missing Links. Missing Links. It's right yeah. there that I couldn't stop looking at. And it was, I was getting quite emotional as I was thinking about it, thinking about the, the pieces of the puzzle that are missing in my own life, in my own story. Mm. I wonder if that's a bit of a common thread from all across parts of the country. Of course it is. I think it is, especially with Aboriginal people. You know, because we've all missed out on all those things, we've missed out on mum, dad, nan, pop, brother, sister, you know, the land and the pink one down, the blue one down the bottom, they're the kids that never came home. These stories cry out to be heard. They cry out for an apology. What, what did you think of Kevin Rudd's apology to the Stolen Generations? I love Kevin Rudd. <laughs> Just putting I it out there up front. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin Rudd got up and he said, I say sorry. Oh my God. 
He said, sorry. So I painted Kevin Rudd. I just felt so overwhelmed because someone had actually, in government, had actually acknowledged us Stolen Generation members. So I painted Kevin Rudd in a Superman outfit, flying over the roof of Cootamundra Girls. All the paintings had barbed wire fence around them depicting the locking in of us. He had the flag in one hand and a pair of wire cutters depicting the cutting of the wire that was around us. We're having a big conversation now about a voice to parliament, the referendum. Mm. I wonder, have you landed on a position about a voice? I think it's really important that we support the voice. Because if you look at all the policies and, and recommendations, we haven't had a voice, you know. We're there, we're fighting with policies and the referendums and that. But nobody's actually sat down and listened to us, what we need. And I think with the voice, it's really important because it will give us our voice because we've never had our voice heard or spoken in Parliament. You're so incredibly busy and you've, you've talked about the challenges with understanding where you fit in, your connection, the missing pieces. How does it feel to be called an elder? I don't mind being called an elder. It's um, something that it's growing, that I'm growing into it, even though I'm 77 next month. I mean, the elder status is important to us too, um, in terms of our knowledge, but also in terms of our standing in the community and standing up to be, you know, role models for our younger ones. Um, so that, you know, they can get up and they can say, oh, Aunt if I did this, Aunt if I did that, she didn't drink, she didn't smoke, all those sorts of things, I think, um, is, is something that we take on the role of that as elders, that we have to be good role models for the younger generations that are coming up. Mm. Aunt Faye Clayton Mosley, thank you so much for joining me on One Plus One. Thank you.